This is the 812 class on February 25th, 2018. Um, our purpose tonight is to have you share your uh, concept analysis information. Um, since they are all educational concepts, even though we come from different backgrounds and professions, it should be um, fine that we can learn from each other um, about the various uh, educational concepts that each of you have jumped into. Um, and then we will ask um, that you give each other feedback. So if you, um, we'll probably have two of you respond to a person at a time. Um, we don't want everybody necessarily to respond um, since there are five of you, but five or six of you. Um, but we will ask that each of you respond at least to two different people throughout the evening. And of course, we want you to think about things that were um, a strength that the person pre presented um, either content-wise or how they did the presentation. And then secondly, if you have any suggestions, you still have a paper that's due next Sunday night, so it can be that you can give somebody, a, um, ask them a question to, to clarify something, or it might be that you will want to um, offer a suggestion on something that, that um, might be um, helpful for them as they work on their final um, paper. So um, the time frame is that you have five to eight minutes to do the presentation and I do um, record your time and put it on your rubric when I send that to you so that you can see how um, much time you did take. And part of being a professional presenter is to always try to get that in within that time frame. I always try to stick too much information. I told that to somebody yesterday that I generally try to cram too much in, so it's very hard for me to not uh, go over my time, but I'm very conscious of that, and I think that we have to be respectful for for other people's times as well. And some of that is getting things down to be clear and concise. So, um, And then after um, everyone has done their presentations, we'll take a few minutes to do some discussion about the concept analysis process, as well as your thoughts about your own educational concept just in general. Um, questions for me before we begin? Okay. Um, if you have any questions, I um, would, I'll try to watch the chat, although that um, sometimes gets away from me. And we will just go in whatever order of whoever wants to go first. But we will ask that all of your microphones be muted um, whenever you present. And I will, we, I will see if I can give somebody the um, presentation um, and if their actual, your actual presentations can come up from your end. But I did load them all so that I can um, run them if we need to. And in that case, you will just say next slide or next, and I will advance your work in whatever format it is. So um, who would like to begin? Or questions, any other questions before we begin? I wanna make sure people are comfortable. You're good, okay. I'll go first. Okay, and who was that? Patty? Okay, let, let's see if, oops, let's see if I can give you the presentation. Susan's came up because I had it loaded, but. Let's... I'd be happy to go second when we're done. Okay. Or if you want to go first, Susan, you can. And yours is all ready to go. Do you want to go, Susan? But you didn't load it. I maybe we'll just go ahead with. I didn't. Patty, were you able to pull yours up? I didn't. Oh, uh, I'm not sure. I've never done this before, so 
Um, there should be a little cloud down in the lower, towards the bottom, and see if you can open that cloud and pull anything up. Okay, so I see, there it is. And then, and then you'll have to search for your document. I found it. And load your file. There it is. And then it, we'll see if it comes up. Okay, I'm looking at it right now, so I'm not sure if there's something else I need to do to... We can't see it yet, so... I can see it. Oh, you can see it? Yeah, the Patty O'Connor Ocean Regulation. Correct. Can the rest of you see it? Yes? Huh, huh, huh. Good. Well, for some reason, I can't see it. Yeah. It's here, though. If I do that, can you guys still see Patty's? Or you don't know? I'm, I still can see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go ahead, Patty, and have you present. All right. My timer going here. Good evening, everybody. I completed my concept analysis over emotion regulation, and it's a concept that I have developed an interest in after I started becoming more conscious of my own anxieties and stresses as a teacher. And I wanted to do something to become a happier, more effective teacher. After researching a variety of literature, including studies, manuals, and websites, I synthesized the most common traits. The definition of emotion regulation is that it's the mental and behavioral processes by which people use situationally adaptive strategies to identify, monitor, evaluate, and modify the intensity and duration of their emotional experiences and expressions in order to accomplish one's goals. Without emotion regulation, our emotions control us but with emotion regulation, we moderate our emotions and keep them in a manageable range, similar to the way we use a thermostat to adjust the temperature in a room. I'm especially interested in emotion regulation within the context of teaching, because teaching is such a profoundly uh, emotional endeavor, and studies have shown that teachers do believe emotion regulation makes them more effective in management discipline and their relationships with students. And teachers are the emotional thermostats and they control the learning environment in their classroom. So it's important that they manage their emotions and regulate their emotions so that the learning environment can be a positive one. And emotion regulation can also reverse the cycle of teacher burnout. The defining attributes of emotion regulation that I synthesized from the literature are that emotion regulation is both conscious and unconscious. It's multifaceted in that it's both biological and behavioral. It's situational, adaptive, strategic. It's a cognitive process. It's adjustable, it's temporal, and it's motivational. And the antecedents of emotion regulation are emotion arousal. And that's where the perception of an external influence that arouses a physiological and cognitive response, also known as an emotion. And an example would be when a child is being defiant, and that might arouse anger or frustration. <laughs> Consequences that result from the practice of emotion regulation include the attainment of a variety of goals, and you might see an increase in mental and physical well-being, positive emotions, improved relationships, life and work satisfaction, and your ability to function, and you may see a reduction in negative emotion and emotion dysregulation. And teachers specifically might see greater effectiveness in teaching, more productive learning environments, increased engagement and enthusiasm, reduced burnout, improved relationships with students, and increased student motivation, attention, and self-discipline. This is the visual representation of the emotion regulation process, and I adapted it from uh, the adaptive coping model, but I did change it quite a bit. And emotion regulation 
It is preceded by the antecedent of emotion arousal. The process starts with the identification of emotion, the evaluation of the emotion, the monitoring of the emotion, and a person would choose to either modify the emotion or tolerate the emotion. And if they modify the emotion, they would use upregulation or downregulation strategies. And the consequences as a result of the emotion regulation process is the goal attainment and increase in mental and physical well-being, positive emotions, improved relationships, life and work satisfaction, and ability to function, and a reduction in negative emotion and emotion dysregulation. And here's an example of the emotion regulation process as seen through the lens of anger. So the antecedent would be the emotion arousal occurring when a student is defiant toward a teacher. And then the teacher identifies the emotion by feeling that she is angry because the student is not following instructions. The teacher would then evaluate the emotion by becoming aware of her raised voice and altered facial expression. She would then monitor the emotion through modification strategies, and in this case she would take a deep breath, lower her voice, and relax her facial muscles. And the consequence of the behavior of the emotion regulation process is that the teacher attains the short-term goal of reducing the anger while also nurturing her relationship with the student and reducing the acting out behavior in the long term, hopefully. And there are a variety of modification strategies for emotion regulation. Some are antecedent-focused, which are implemented before the emotion arousal. And these are research-wise shown to be the most effective at emotion regulation. And there's four basic antecedent strategies, situation selection, situation modification, attentional deployment, and cognitive change. And that's also known as cognitive reappraisal, and that's where you reinterpret the situation to modify its emotional effects. And an example of an antecedent-focused strategy is a situational selection strategy, and this is one I've actually used myself. And that's where a teacher uses a guided meditation app such as Headspace or Relax during their daily planning period in order to proactively regulate their emotions throughout the school day. So deregulation of emotion. And there's also response-focused strategies for modifying emotion, and those are implemented after emotion arousal, and they help manage the physiological or behavioral responses to an emotion. And an example of this is behavioral suppression, and that's where you consciously hold back your outward displays of emotion. And an example would be a teacher consciously maintaining a calm, low voice tone so as not to express anger when talking to a disobedient child. And the past research has definitely shown a connection between emotion regulation and teachers feeling more effective or perceiving that they're more effective. But more research needs to be done, really observational research, that would verify that teachers who feel that they're reducing their negative emotions are actually able to do it. Also, more research on the relationship between that emotion regulation strategies and the teacher effectiveness. And Fried asks us to consider classroom emotion regulation from different perspectives, such as teacher regulation of student emotions, student and teacher regulation of their own emotions, and student regulation of other student emotions. And my personal goal is to explore the connection between emotion regulation, teacher effectiveness, and the possible impact it has on learner outcomes. So in summary, emotion regulation has positively impacted my own personal life and professional life as a teacher, and I'm looking forward to contributing my own findings to help further our understanding of this important concept. So thank you for listening, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, if you just unmute yourself and ask Patty any questions or offer any feedback for her, please. You got muted again, Angie. And? Okay, I'm unmuted. Sorry, I think my fingers are a little too touchy on the keyboard. I was curious on the visual, when you talk about tolerating an emotion, is there any offshoot of that? Could there ever be any variation where maybe you're not absolutely tolerating, you're not making an absolute change? I'm just wondering if there would be a branch over there where you might expand that a little bit. So you're not tolerating it 
but you're not, maybe, not maybe you're tolerating it minimally, maybe you're not making a, a, an emotional change necessarily. Do you see what I mean? I, I don't know enough about this topic. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just a question. Yeah, it's a great question. I have not thought about that. I mean, emotion regulation is a process, and you're not constantly going through the process, so I suppose when you're feeling that way, you're probably pretty even keel, would be my guess, without having done a lot of research on it. So that's a really great question. I'll have to look into that. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about that before. Now, I, I found the presentation really interesting. It is something I don't know that much about, and for at any level, I think this is something really applicable. It's something I know I could use, even teaching at the college level. That was one of the things I was surprised when I started doing this, is I started looking into it because of things I was experiencing as a teacher, but it's really influenced my life in so many other ways, in every aspect. So that's been... That is true. Is it's, it's really applicable to every person, to every human being, because we all experience emotions. So. Great. Well, thank you. I'll put myself on mute now so other people can talk. <laughs> thank you for answering my question. Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you. Is, is, it a, is it a subcategory of emotional intelligence? Like, how would those two correlate? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I actually saw that come up in the research, and then I also saw um, emotion emotional labor, emotion labor also. So there's different um, uh, categorizations. I didn't go too much into those different ones. I really focused on the emotion regulation, looking for research articles about that specific thing. So that would be something that I would, if, you know, if I were to carry forward, I would need to look into all these different names and if they're subcategories or if that's just a word for it or exactly oh. what that means. Okay. Great question, thank you. One quick one. Is that okay, Dr. Linden? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I wonder, Patty, first of all, I love it. I think this is amazing. It, it could help so many kids and teachers to be more interactive and more on the same page and paying attention to the whole person. The whole concept is, I think, where we need to be with, with learners in terms of recognizing those cues and that emotional connection. I wondered if you had looked at any of the, anything on frequency, so like apps like Headspace, Headspace, which is great, an app that I use all the time. You know, the more you do it, of course, with meditation, the better it is. If you had seen any data or been able to dig into frequency data. Um, and then the other thing is, um, just a comment, is that I've worked with some kids on some of the, um, the kids' apps for calming, which are kind of cool, that you can find a whole bunch of them on commonsensemedia.org. So there's some really cool ones out there, but anyway, I just wondered if you had heard anything or thought anything about frequency data. So, well, the studies that I looked at, the research that I saw, it was mostly kind of establishing that teachers do regulate emotion and that the future research needs to be now on um, the, how, like the, the strategies are the most effective, the ones that work the most, and I would assume that frequency would be part of that, is how often would you need to practice the emotion regula regulation, and that's kind of where I'm interested in going with my research is getting in and actually having teachers go through a program and where they learn the specific strategies and then observing them and seeing, can you see when they're observing, when they're um, using emotion regulation regulation and is it having an impact on the students and then I thought it'd be interesting to get the student side of it too and survey them or interview them and see if they could see an improvement in the teacher are they actually being perceived as being more effective on the student side of it so that's a great question and I think that's what needs to be researched now for the future is what are the strategies that work best so and that's where I'm going to, going to go with the um, the, the class, the course that I'm going to design is going to be specifically for people to figure to uh, learn emotion regulation strategies and then uh, pick the ones that work best for them and figure out what works best and come up with a plan. So I'm excited to find out more about the different strategies that there are that we can use. So. Great, Patty. Did that answer your question, Susan? Definitely, thank you. Um, any other last thoughts for Patty?
Patty, could you go back to the um, the first example that you gave after you went through your um, consequences and your your um, diagram? I think that you had a of anger. Yes. Yes. The reason I wanted you to bring this up is that we don't um, for this class because it's um, a short period of time and a one credit class, we don't actually have you do a um, a, a model um, case for um, this class, but this might be an example of that kind of a um, exemplar or a model case. Um, so the example you gave would sort of fit into that, um, where, where the people don't really identify what these are, but they give the the description or the scenario um, for the case and that way people can and is there somebody typing let's see <laughs> let's see um anyway um that that's just for the rest of you to see that that would be a, a situation that you could include if you actually went on and did more with a concept analysis is to have a a model case. So thank and, you. And I just I included that because as a learner myself, when I'm reading these research studies, when they provide examples, it just helps illustrate for me so much more. So sure. I always try to include them. Sure. Thank you. So yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very um good presentation. Thank you. I'd be happy to go next. Okay. Um, I am going to. That was Angela, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was Angela. Sorry, I didn't know if you were speaking. Was that Ange that was speaking? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. No problem. I forget that you just heard the voices and I don't. That was a little awkward. <laughs> And so, Ange, I gave you the presentation um, screen. So let's see, can you pull yours up? Yeah, where did you say we go again? The, there's a cloud yeah. in the lower. Oh, I see it. Do you I see that? It. Yeah. Sorry, I was just having a hard time looking at the cloud. <laughs> and, then, and then it says um, select your file or something like that. It's so that you browse for your file and then pull it up. And I think you have to upload it then, too. Oh. It is not in this computer. Um, where do I find it to upload it? I don't see it on here. Oh, it's not your computer that you're using? You know, I'm using the laptop from the... Cop from the Campus office. Um, I my daughter's going to see if she can share it to this computer for some reason, maybe. Boy, I'm just a tricky one, aren't I? Nothing is ever easy for me. I'm just going to tell you right now. Let's see. In the best of the world. <clears throat> Let me see. I don't so, know that I got yeah, it. Yeah, maybe somebody else would want to do it while I try Yes, to do yeah, let's do that. I did not know this was going to be an issue. I don't let's, want to take up your time. Let's do that. Okay, who else would like to go? I'll go. Susan? I'd be happy to go here. Oh, was, oh who said I, they wanted to go? I will. Susan, Susan will. Okay. I will. <laughs> okay. So you go to... I see the little TV by my name. I'm not seeing a cloud though. Down in this area down here. Down. Sort of next to the webcams pictures. Next to the webcam pictures. To the right of it. Okay. To the right of the webcam picture. I see a presentation um, that you just did, that with Patty's. Um, and that just keeps pulling up when I do that. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Oops. There we go. Got it. Okay. 
And I just made the screen big by some. Okay, so whenever you're ready, um, Susan. All right, I'm going to set my stopwatch and go. Okay, so everybody, my um, paper and my concept is about the fusion of innovation in social work, specific to children's evidence-based mental health practices. So what that means is the means by which research is disseminated on how to do evidence-based practice when working with children with severe and persistent mental health issues. How does the research actually get to the end user, the social worker, and get implemented in a way that is effective and that it's, it, they're implementing it in the way that the researchers intended. So we know what research really works. How do we make sure that it stays true and potent have the same potency as it did in the clinical trial that it does in the in the end. So um, I put together just a couple things um, uh, for you to get a better idea of what I do and what we do. Uh, social workers do a lots and lots of different stuff, including mental health treatment. So sometimes I think there's some misconceptions about social work. Uh, people sometimes say to me, "All you do is take away kids." You know, that's you know not the way that it is anymore. We do a lot of outreach and advocacy and a lot of research is done on mental health practice, um, a lot of uh, policy changes and working um, on national issues such as poverty and global, global is issues like that. But my specific piece is for this purpose is about the clinician, the social worker that will be implementing therapy treatments, mental health uh, therapy treatments for children and their families. So we use um, the ecological systems theory, which um, Rothenbrenner developed along with Lewin at the same time they did some work together on this model, which is probably something you've seen very similar in healthcare. But we look at the entire person with a biopsychosocial perspective. And it's very important for my topic because we look at the overlay of biology, social aspects, psychology, and how that intertwines with mental health practice. As you can see, mental health is there in the middle, um, and so it's the core. Um, and it, Patty, it really seems to go well with your discussion too because it's a lot of that same emotion regulation, um, working with individuals in various contexts and different settings to get them to be the best person they can be at that moment regardless of the stressors that are out there. So just to give you guys an idea, half of all mental illness uh, begins before the age of 14, and only one in five kids receive the help that they need, which is speaking to the severity and the importance of this piece. Um, we know that the emerging research on children with mental health is about best practice, medication management, behavioral health treatment, working specifically in schools. But what we need to find out is the most effective and meaningful way to get the information to the social workers and have them change their practice patterns. Uh, it's not as easy as it might seem. Um, I'm going to skip my slide here and come back to it, but just to give you guys an idea about the fusion of innovation and the steps, this is a great cartoon because if you can see it, you know, over here on the left, the little people at the bottom, we've got the innovators over on the left side. Somebody made something really cool, um, and I kind of think about it like, let's just pretend it's the iPhone. So we've got somebody made something really cool, and they're like, wow, this is so awesome. And then the product itself on the top is like, oh, I'm just sort of figuring out what I'm doing here. Then you have your early adopters of innovation. This iPhone is the best thing I've ever had. And then the product starts working more. You kind of get over the chasm of the kinks are enough looked out that it can actually make it. And then you get your early adopters, which would be, you know, this is funny because it says, oh, I heard Ashton Kutcher had one. Well, then everybody wants one. So those would be like the people that, you know, they're getting the new stuff all of the time and they're seeing the innovation as it comes over the hill. And then we have our late majority when it's like, you know, everybody can get that at Sam's Club. And then our laggers, which would be people like my mom and dad who just got their first cell phone this year. <laughs> so they're saying, what, what new product, right? And then by that time, the innovation is kind of got his, his wheelchair out, you know, and it's not really innovation anymore and it's time for a change. Um, I think this is important because it really is very closely tied to the steps of how innovation happens, but we just have to apply it to something more complex. Um, and which takes me to my slide here. Um, 
it might be a little small to see. I should have made it bit bigger. But at the beginning is the innovative um, identification of new research, and then taking into consideration cultural aspects of the population. We don't want to have innovation that would be counterinducive to a family's culture, and we don't want to take away culture from people. We want to have innovation that helps support the culture, which is one of the biggest pieces. And then commitment to change, and then the implementation factors, and then the issues of how that actually happens with improved outcomes. And along the way, we've got a commitment to the change process by all involved, and we have the system feedback, so there's feedback all along the way as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing more research on this piece uh, because it's very um, kind of new, unfortunately, um, with specific to mental health treatment in this population uh, in terms of finding assessment tools that are adequate and in terms of being cognizant of I know what you were saying, Patty, too, about teachers are busy through the day and they're trying to get through the day and get things done. It's the same with social workers, too. So how do we teach them new things and help them see that it's an innovation and get that knowledge that they really need to make that So that is, is basic. Um, that is my presentation. I've got some references here. I didn't list out all the antecedents. Um, the only one in specific that I would want to speak to is that uh, there is strategic planning was kind of a tricky one for me because it's an antecedent, but it's also a consequence. So, I and mean, then Dr. Linden and I kind of had some back and forth, a uh, great dialogue via email about determining where that would fit because it seems like it's something that has to happen as an attribute and then an antecedent consequence as well. So, I'm still kind of trying to figure that stuff out. Um, so, I think I'll just go ahead and stop that there and see if there's any questions. I have a question. This is Ange. Hey, um, is there some way that within this that we're counting the resistance? I assume there's probably, even in, in your area, there's going to be resistance to change. Like right? the people who are set in a way of doing things they can't, for the life of them, see that there's a more effective way or a better way to maybe do things or something. How do you account for that resistance? That's a great question, Ange. And that's something that's actually one of my, my big five attributes. So it's a really an attribute of the teaching of innovation is the resistance factor. It's always going to be there, and it's part of the process and the recognition that resistance um, to the process and the adaption is expected, and laying it kind of cards on the table. And then it really is that kind of what we're learning in our other class of adult learning theory about how you uh, look at motivation and. So it's, I think it's different depending on um, the situation, but definitely something um, to consider. So it's a good point. Other questions? Um, um, yeah, I have a question too. Um, I really like your topic. I've been following it and through the discussion posts since we've started. Um, I was just kind of curious, and you may have touched on this, um, but what do you see with um, I, I don't know how to word this, I guess, hopefully it makes sense. Um, working with other er like fields like occupational therapy, nursing, physical therapy, because I know social work works a lot with, you know, all different aspects. So do you see, what kind of relationship do you see with this? Does that make sense? Yeah, Chelsea, that makes perfect sense because, you know, like a lot of you with our topics, and yes, it's been so interesting to read all of you guys' topics on the discussion boards, and I'm thinking, I have, thou there are thousands of articles about disease motivation. I cannot imagine what it's like if you're researching motivation or emotion regulation. There's probably just that many more. Um, so there's been a lot of research articles specific to different disciplines. And it's interesting, um, and Dr. Linden brought this up at some point too, how so much of the things that we're studying, it, it's a, it, it cuts across, regardless of what your specific discipline is. It's all sort of the same because it's all about adult learning and education. Um, 
but social work's a little different than some settings because like occupational therapy, um, I'm not sure one of the students in class is studying that. You know, that's a specific, pretty specific setting. But for social work, I might be diffusing innovation of a mental health practice in somebody's home in North Omaha in the, you know, or I might be at a hospital at the med center. So if the, if the contextual pieces are pretty complicated, um, and there's some really interesting articles that I'm looking forward to digging into one of the thousand that I found to try that talks about those sort of things and trying to really take it from up here and take it down a little further and get into those two components. Awesome. Great Thanks. job. Can I ask one question? Sure. Okay. Um, in your model, Susan, which I really love your talk, it's very interesting. Um, I couldn't, you know, I was trying to look there. How, how is it, or how is education, uh, where's the education piece in it exactly? Because I think that's the part that weren't the most important since it's so complex of a topic, it's not such a kind of topic, right? Yeah, that's, exactly. a, that's a good point because to me, it's the interchange of the information that's being provided and how we get that research or information to change somebody's behavior so that they learn it to a level, I think, of like doing that from that whatever it is, from whatever it is, where you have that, that farthest piece where it's the real integration of the information that you can know it backwards, forwards, that you can practice it, that you can change behavior. Um, so it's really, it, it, to me, it fits so much with adult learning theory, our other class right now, because it's about understanding it to solve a real world problem, so that it has to be unique for everybody, and everybody's going to learn it in a little different way. So, um, yeah, it's, it's different because it's not really classroom contextual necessarily, but it's like the world is the classroom and how we get the information out to people. So. That's something like, different. I guess, um, yeah, I guess I'm asking, are you hoping that your students are where you're going to teach them that they need to be the place, like that point where they need to be really informed of what's changing in practice to get that information out to them so that it becomes as fast and they know what's going on in the research? Or yeah. I think more to you, it's not so much about my students at the bachelor's or master level, but more practicing clinicians, more facilitator-based training, um, training that's happening at the workplace to get okay. to changes faster. So, like, for example, when the hospital gets that EPIC, you know, or whatever system they're using for medical records, how, what, what would he have done to med do that differently to help them really understand it in a way that would have really done what everybody said it was supposed to do in terms of helping drive practice and clinical decisions? Okay, that helps. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Um, Susan, I um, it, on the references here, I noticed that you had your cartoon um, credited, and for those of you who use cartoons, and videos also and things we are supposed to be crediting those and so that's just a great example of that and then you also made a reference to um, assessment tools and Walker and Avant on their um, one of the other pieces that we don't include here are their um, the empirical um, data or empirical tools that they would um, generally recommend that you also include in a con concept analysis of how do you measure the um, information that goes along with it. So that was just another good example of, of a piece that we don't include in our concept analyses that we do, but a full-blown one should probably have that um, empirical reference um, okay. in there too. So. All right, thank you. Very good. Any other um, questions or comments for Susan? Um, Dr. Lynn, I have a question for you about, because I used quite a few images in my point, but I used the um, 
Collective Commons one? Do I still have to cite those in my references that they're the Collective Commons? Not that I'm aware of. I think that that's okay. I think it's when you are taking something from a site that doesn't fall under that. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, who would like to go next? I think I have my first. <laughs> okay. So this is a match. I think I can pull it up now once I okay. send it to me or give you any book. Okay, let's try this one. I emailed it to myself on this desktop and on this laptop, so. Okay. And you see the, the cloud where you... Yep, I got the cloud. Now I'm just getting on the desktop. I'm going to pull the file. Yep, I found it. Okay. Now let's see how this works. It takes it a I was I had thought that you all had done this before in your classes, so I am sorry that I didn't give you much of a, a heads up on this. Oh, so that's perfectly all right. Well, so there you go. You're all set, and go ahead. Yes, can, I can. Can everybody else? Thumbs up. Okay. Good. Okay. Good deal. All right. My um, topic, and I, I, I titled it "Sex Really Does Matter." I'm looking at the effect of gender on students' evaluations of uh, faculty teaching. And that being said, I don't know how to go on to the next slide here. Okay, now I do. <laughs> Sorry about that. There's a little um, arrow there, yeah, at the bottom. Yeah, particularly on, on this PowerPoint, I look at the definition, of course, of gender bias. Uh, it's defining attributes, antecedents, consequences, and then just a, a statement on future implications. So first of all, I, I know in our discussion course, um, we initially posted uh, our definitions, and I did do a little bit of changing based on some feedback from um, some of my peers, so thank you very much for that. But I uh, ended up with the following definition. On a ratings-based faculty course evaluation, the validity of student ratings affecting the accurate portrayal of the quality of teaching resulting from culturally conditioned gender stereotypes resulting in invalid indicators of teaching effectiveness. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of different definitions of what constitutes gender bias. Um, but from what I've read and what my intentions are in my project, this, I think this defines it for me. So that is my definition. Uh, and then when I look at defining attributes, uh, these are the things that must be present. I, I, I need to, of course, have male and female uh, born faculty. And I, I look at sex born based on what, what sex they're actually born into, not what they identify with or changes that may take place in their lives. What sex are they born into, are they male or female? Um, uh, an agreed upon definition of what constitutes effective teaching. We all have to have an idea of something we can agree on uh, for that because we might all have different ideas of what we think is effective. Uh, I also am interested in having, making sure there's a ratings-based effective teaching evaluation. There are different tools for evaluation and it's important that this be ratings-based. Uh, you need to have a variety of communities so that you get differences. And then an understanding of the students' concepts of themselves and their ways based on societal influence. Originally, when I looked at defining attributes, I had just listed that as self-image, and I know Dr. Moore and I talked about it, and I think, for me anyway, this seems to better explain it. So I'm interested in, in hearing what you guys think about that when, when I finish going through this. But um, So rather than self-image, the concepts of themselves and their ways based on societal influence. Next, I looked at antecedents, um, and antecedents are really all student-related. Uh, I look at student mindset, personality traits, uh, their unique perspectives, their own views on teaching effectiveness, outside influence, those things we can't, we have no control over that occur outside of the classroom, and then the inside or classroom influences. We also look at intrinsic versus in extrinsic advancement of perception. Uh, underlying issues that may be occurring in and out of the classroom, interest in the course that they're taking, and then personal skills. And in some instances, selection of faculty, when there are multiple sections of a class available, uh, do they select faculty based on the gender of the instructor? And then consequences. Well, I, I, one of the other things that I talked about uh, with Dr. Lillian was my consequences aren't just 
to sort of posit it. So mine are all sort of on the other end. We're expecting this behavior to occur, so we're identifying something that isn't necessarily positive. So my consequences, therefore, are not. Um, what, we at, what, what we found was a systematic within group bias, so that was present. Uh, gender specific trait scores uh, identified female students rated female faculty higher and male students rated male faculty higher. <laughs> female students found organization, specific personal characteristics, and their perception of preparedness more important than male students who found credentials and experience more important in their rating effective uh, teaching. Male students rated female faculty lower than male and even more negatively or lower than female students did. Male students rated female faculty lower and female students rated female faculty higher. Rapport rated as more important as a more important expectation of male faculty for teaching effectiveness than female faculty, regardless of gender of the student. Female faculty teaching effectiveness based on building more supportive relationships with students. So that was more important for them, the, the relationships, the support that they provided to students. Faculty members of same sex as students evaluators rated higher than the opposite sex. And then faculty believed male by name only rated higher than uh, faculty believed to be female, regardless of student gender. And this was on online course, uh, it, uh, when they were evaluating online courses, which I found interesting because that is one situation where maybe we can control for that a little bit. And then finally, future implications. Uh, unfortunately, there are just too many factors or attitudes that, that work can into a play or that affect evaluation, so it really is impossible to control for gender bias in students' evaluations of teaching effectiveness. So the only real solution in, in my eye is that we would have to look at how we evaluate uh, those evaluations or how we interpret them. Uh, and I just closed with, with this quote because I thought this was uh, a really true form. Teaching evaluations are usually not corrected for possible gender bias. The student gender composition nor the fact that not all students participate in evaluations. And then number at all further added that characteristics completely unrelated to teacher effectiveness also affect teaching evaluations, leaving the results driven by individual perceptions and stereotypes rather than true quality of teaching. And I find, in my own experience, I find that to be true. And then, of course, I missed my own references in the back. It's kind of small. Sorry about that. I had quite a few on there. I wanted to make sure I got my own. So I guess that's what I have to say about mine at this point. So I'm ready to entertain any questions that you might have. Uh, I've got a question for you. Sure. Well, wow, this is really, really interesting for me because it ties right in with what I want to research, which is, so teachers that are practicing emotion regulation are perceiving that it's making them more effective, but really nobody knows if it is or not. And so it's all about this perception, right? And so that's what I'm interested in, are students perceiving that they're more effective. And I was wondering, so are there any ratings based effective teacher evaluation, evaluations available today? Because that was something that, that I was going to look into for my research that you know of. Did well, you all of ours in our campus are ratings based. They rate you uh, at a certain level, so they're all ratings based. Well, ours are here, and actually, most of the colleges that I've taught at have used a ratings based scale. So, are you saying there should be like a common? One, like one common. Um, no, there just has to be some, but in, in each of these, they could be different as long as they're all ratings based. So they're going to vary from institution, probably to institution. You're probably not going to find it very easy to get um, multiple colleges at various locations and various teaching levels to agree to the same evaluation form. So the goal is to find those that are the ratings based, or at least get them to agree and do some type of ratings based evaluation. <laughs> It's interesting because yeah. teaching is teaching, so it does seem like you should be you should be able to be on commonalities of what makes an effective teacher, you know. So really interesting. Thank you. No, no, thank you for the questions. Yeah, and I'm just gonna.
have, did you look at IDEA or it, when you start looking at different evaluations, has anybody heard of IDEA? Do you not have that used on you at all as a, a faculty? Um, I, I think maybe you mentioned that once before to me, and that is something I need to uh, look into a little bit more. I'm only bringing that up because that might be something that you want to look at, just because yeah. it's supposed to be based on um, the outcomes of the course, and it's supposed to, um, the student evaluate themselves based on their motivation, um, uh -huh. how they were motivated in the course, and then that adjusts the score that they gave the instructor, but there's a white paper on it, on the analytics right. on how it's done. And that would certainly be something I would rather see institutions use. I know at, at Wayne State, actually, I taught at a number of colleges and they were not used to anything of that nature, where they've accounted for those biases. And it's amazing to me that, that all of these educated people don't <laughs> teach That's really interesting, well, isn't it? About to make sure we're, we're testing and we're judging the right thing. Because I really believe, I know it, at, at Wayne State, our evaluation system is horrible. They really, truly do not evaluate the effect of teaching. Um, I find that some of the results, I've been here for 24 years, they changed them a little bit in that time, but not a lot. Um, really seems to be more of a popularity contest. And I find that we are often put in a position to teach to the evaluation, if that makes any sense to you. And when you're an adjunct faculty or you're not a tenured faculty, those, there's too much importance placed on those teaching evaluations and those results and not the interpretation of those results, if that makes sense. Very much. Yeah, it is amazing that that's not further studied, like you said, when we have all these. Well, I think, I mean, we're all educated. How are you educated? Why is that? Not something we think about. I mean, I think about it, but I think a lot of it. So. Right, right. Very good. Thank you very much. And, um, and I apologize. And most of my references, when I downloaded it, shifted everything. So my that's all right. page doesn't look pretty good, but it did on the original. So sorry about that. It does that. Christina, I think Christina? there's a, a chat for you, a question. What did you call that? Idea? What, what's um, it? It's idea. I can get you guys the um, URL for it. They have. It's oh, really that would be terrific. Yeah, I think in nursing we're going to go to it because um, the nice thing is there's a teaching um, evaluation part of it, and so when you get the results back based on how you're evaluated, it will actually tie you back to I think it's pod notes or white papers or something that will tell you how to boost that score if it's low. So it's actually based on mm. evidence, and it will give you that's helpful, not just I didn't like your shoes or something. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, Christina, you could share that maybe um, in a um, Canvas email to the whole class because other people that aren't here tonight might be interested in that as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, very good. So, um, who would like to go next? I'll go. Okay. Right. Is that Kelsey? Uh, either way, it's fine. She can go first. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see, Robin. There, it took that. Huh. There it went. Okay. Now let's see. Can you see the little cloud? There you go, Robin. Everybody can see it. You guys can see it? Yep, I think you're set. Okay, go ahead. I started um, my educational concept on differentiated instruction. And the reason why I chose this is because when we would do professional development days, the, the 
presenter would be so excited and so full of enthusiasm on how to bring differentiated instruction into the classroom. And then you would have a portion of teachers that would roll their eyes and say it's a waste of time and I don't have enough time in the classroom in general. How am I going to be able to meet the needs of all of these individual learners? And so I decided to choose this topic and once I started to get into the literature of it, I realized that there are a lot of definitions of differentiated instruction and that it you can implement it in multiple ways and suggestions of how people can uh, implement differentiated instruction in the classroom has just been really interesting to me because a lot of the times with differentiated instruction they would say it's small group whole group uh, or I'm sorry one-on-one -on -one or small group and I found with my research that they're saying you can do it in whole group as well so um, that's just a, a brief um, explanation as to why I, I chose differentiated instruction I, I'm sorry you guys can hear my dog <laughs> I apologize. Um, so differentiated instruction is an educational concept that allows an instructor to identify the specific way an individual learns and adjust their teaching style to meet those needs when content is introduced. Um, and so, for example, um, you know what, I'm just going to put my dog away really quick. Is he, is he putting too much background noise? I think it's okay if you can, if okay. it's if it's not any worse. Okay, I just want to make sure it's not echoing. Um, so the introduction of uh, differentiated instruction is that in the classroom you have such diverse learners, and that the 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 process is to try to find a way to uh, determine their learning style and then adjust your teaching style to meet those needs. So I have. Defined, I have defined differentiated instruction as an approach that recognizes diverse learners' strengths and weaknesses in order to develop an instructional plan that focuses on learning style, products, or demonstrations of student learning, environment, and content in order to meet the individual needs of the learner. So with the student learning, that's essentially finding the, the learning style of the student. And then the product demonstrations those are actually the, the work that the student produces, such as um, assignments, the projects. Um, it, it allows you to see where, where the student is. An environment is obviously the classroom and how your classroom is set up. Do you have it in a manner that meets the, the needs of the diverse learners? And then the content, which is the material or the curriculum that is presented. Um, the attributes are learning style. And that allows the instructor to um, understand the, the learning style of the student and then adjust the, the content um, introduction or exposure to it depending on that, that child's learning, um, learning style. And a lot of the literature has referenced Gardner's multiple intelligences, but for the most part I have found that it's been Bloom's taxonomy that is the main focus on how they determine the learning style of the students. And they say that uh, oftentimes they'll, it'll be an accumulation of the student's uh, past work, past academic record, uh, how they learn in order to differentiate the learning. Modeling, the modeling content uh, is according to the learning style of the student. So for example, if they are visual, auditory, verbal, physical, logical, the teacher can address the content or introduce the content in a way that, that meets those needs. Uh, and then assessment is just making sure that the objectives are met. Uh, feedback, and that allows the student to see if they are reaching their goals and progressing appropriately. And by differentiated instruction, it allows the teacher to give often immediate feedback, which when, um, when you're doing feedback, that's usually the best kind is the most immediate to correct um, wherever the, the problem is. And then adjustment, if the teacher would be able to then look back and see, are my modifications, are my accommodations, are those um, meeting the needs of the student and do I need to adjust my lesson to make sure that I'm meeting those needs. <clears throat> the antecedents are uh, understanding of students' learning styles are necessary to individualize instruction. And understanding of instruction to meet individual learning needs and styles are to be implemented in all forms, such as one-on-one, -on -one, small group, or whole class instruction. 
And this was a new thing for me because in all of my uh, staff development classes, or they would always say differentiated instruction was strictly one-on-one -on -one or small group. But now they're implementing it that you can do it as a whole class instruction. Um, and it's usually through uh, discussion. And they say that by doing this, this allows higher order thinking and problem solving skills, which kids are going to, going to need outside of the classroom in any capacity. So it, it allows them to, to meet their needs just as, as younger learners as they would go out into the world and they have a situation that they need to work through. They, they have to use those skills, those problem solving and higher order thinking skills in order to solve those problems. The consequences, the first one is by differentiating instruction, teachers can A, challenge all learners by providing very levels of difficulty, B, vary the degree of scaffolding, and C, vary the way in which student, students work. And this is specific, as I talked with Dr. Linden about this particular consequence, is that by differentiating certain lessons and certain plans, you're able to then challenge learners according to their their ability and and you're able to change the scaffolding and, and the way that the, the child works and how they learn. And the other consequence is differentiated instruction results in readiness to learn, provides a positive effect on learning, has the ability to challenge independent learning and provides authentic learning experiences for the student. And my representation of the concept is a little small. Um, but it's essentially the teacher can determines the lesson, whether it will be a one-on-one, -on -one, a small group, or a whole group, and that the teacher will then determine that student's learning style, the type of assignment that they will be providing, um, the environment that the student will be in, and then, of course, the content. And for examples of one-on-one, -on -one, a small group and whole group, differentiated instruction, uh, for example, whole group, when you do a read aloud with a large group, you have so many diverse learners with so many different backgrounds and experiences. And so as the teacher is reading, they're modeling using their instructional strategies, but they're then able to ask questions on how those, how the text either relates to them, how they a text to text, a text to self, a text to world. And then by communicating and having discussions, it's exposing the other kids to certain backgrounds and different cultures on their interpretation of the material. So that's a differentiated instruction example of a whole group. Um, small group example of differentiated instruction is uh, level reading groups and um, with the kids at the certain levels, but you're able to then ask probing questions and challenge them a little bit more to define uh, their experience with, with the material and how they're able to relate it and apply it. And then finally, the one-on-one -on -one, um, tiering type of differentiated instruction. I found this was int very interesting, is that a lot of times some of the teachers are now adapting a way to teach the material or the content and, and provide instruction. And then when they assign something, they give the students various options as to how they want to complete the assignment. So if, if the assignment is, you know, at, let me know what your opinion on this book summary. If a child is more uh, connected to writing the summary and typing it, or acting it out, or doing a speech, or making a project, or along those lines, it allows the student to express their knowledge of the, of the content in a manner that's more conducive to them. Uh, the, the downfall that I have found with differentiated instruction is that there are going to be times where kids will have to adapt to situations they're not necessarily cut out. And they need to have that opportunity to, you know, they're not always going to have that choice of people catering to what they need. So I think there's a, a lot of positives that go with it, but I think if it's, if it's too in-depth, it may be detrimental. And just make sense. Thank you, Robin. Questions or comments for Robin? Um, I had just one kind of question, and it's just um, that's a really great topic. I really enjoy learning about the, you know, the learning styles and things like that. Um, 
I really don't have a much of a background in teaching as far as especially like a large classroom. Um, I usually deal with one field work student at a time. Um, so do you find it difficult when you're with a large classroom to really attack each learning style and um, and you kind of uh, approached my other question I was going to have too about um, whether um, focusing on one learning style sets back somebody who has a different learning style. I don't I don't know if that makes sure. sense, but well, I think a lot of it, um, it, it relates to what Kathy's topic was, and um, also along with Susan's is that you have so many different experiences and. Uh, that they may have one learning style and I might try to teach to that learning style, but if I have a previous student that has been dealing with sexual abuse and they have behavior problems, addressing that learning style is not necessarily my forefront focus. Um, and, you know, a lot of times you have behavioral issues and, you know, I, I think that's one of the reasons why I chose it is because I wanted to see why Teach, some teachers fully embraced it, and others said, absolutely not, this just, just, it just doesn't work. And so um, I think that's a lot of the time is some of the teachers are saying, that it's, there's too much time and effort, I have too many other things going on to address all of these different learning styles. I'm just gonna teach as a whole. And I, you know, I, I completely understand that every classroom is different and every teaching style is different, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that does help, thank you speak to that a little bit because I have, I have I've been a teacher for the past 10 years and it, it's professionally it was one of the top two things that I wanted to get better at and it always got pushed to the back burner and I've gotten a little bit better at it but I still struggle with well, for the reasons that you say just the, the, having the time to do it you have to prioritize other things and it, it just it doesn't seem to happen but um, w one of the ways that I've try to incorporate it more is by offering choice for kids and so that they can have a couple options and then they can choose the learn the, the um, way to do the assignment in the way that works best for their learning style so that has been one way that I've approached it but it is it's a really interesting topic and I really enjoyed your presentation and um, I learned a lot about it and it's really really good so nice job Thank you. <laughs> Any other thoughts for um, Robin? Very good. And your visual re representation was really cool too. <laughs> really nice. She asked if it was too um, teacher oriented and or. And I told her, no, we want to see those visuals that help us remember what the content is. So, very good. Thank you, Robin. And let's... And I think it ties in really nicely with adult learning as well, that we're learning. So, yeah. It, a number of you have commented on that throughout that, that that's a good fit to have the two things. Um, Really, when you get down to it, all these educational concepts, we can all learn a lot from each one of them. So it's nice to hear a variety of them tonight. Okay, Kelsey or Christina? I'll go. And who said that? Okay, Kelsey. Okay. Yeah. It'll be coming your way just a minute. It hasn't flipped yet to you. Okay. Now I think it did. And so... Yep, I see the cloud. Okay. Um, there you go. Okay. Can everyone see it? Let's see. I was just going to see if I could make it a little bigger. Does that yeah, help? Sorry the handout route. That's all right. Okay, go ahead, Kelsey. Okay. 
Well, I chose the educational concept of service learning, and I chose this because um, my passion has really been to help those in need. Um, I have a real uh, big interest in um, ho the homeless and high-risk populations, and I really feel that there's that students could really benefit members of the community in, that are in need of services, and then in return they can also see um, uh, their strengthening of their own learning and professional development. And when I did this topic, I kind of focused more on my field of occupational therapy, um, but really it can go in any direction. I feel like any field um, could benefit from service learning. Um, so through my review of the literature, I was able to find several definitions that um, clearly accurately explain this concept. Um, and from there, I developed my own definition, and that is that service learning is a structured educational method in which students serve the need of the community based on the course curriculum and learning objectives. Community members are able to receive the care that they need, and students are able to grow personally, socially, and professionally. So um, going to my visual, um, that, and I did, I want to apologize, I made a couple of changes and it was after I had submitted this, so I will let you know what was changed. It's just a couple of things. Um, so in the middle, I have, in the blue, is my um, service learning topic, and then within that is my defining attributes. Um, I did move curriculum to the orange section of the antecedent, um, and I added ex experiential learning. So with um, service learning is a form of experiential learning in that um, students are able to complete real hands-on treatment sessions with um, real people, basically members of the community, and therefore they're le learning through the experience. They're given more independence and control, and they're actually able to see firsthand, you know, what they're going to be doing as a practicing or a practitioner. Um, and then my second attribute um, that I felt was important is the understanding that there's a need in the community. And I really think that um, for students to become more into the idea of service learning and community service, they need to understand what exactly is going on within their community, where the need is, you know, who's not insured or underinsured and can't receive services, things like that. Um, and then, like I said in the orange, I did add um, move curriculum to the antecedents along with the other two. Um, one of the antecedents that I feel is important is practice standards. So from an OT standpoint, I'm thinking about the American Occupational Therapy Association as well as the Accreditation Council for OT Education. Um, those are both um, the areas that focus on, you know, deciding what standards are important, um, what they want OT programs to follow and to include in order to become accredited. Same thing with, you know, requirements for licensure. Um, so it's really important that when developing a service learning program that if there's an understanding of what these standards are, um, that way you know you're following your curriculum as it is a part of, a, it is part of the program itself, um, which also leads to the program curriculum. So I feel that um, knowing what the course objectives are, even what your mission statement for the college is, and tying that all into it, and then also, you know, tying it to a course in general and following those objectives. That way students understand what their overarching goal is. And then the other antecedent is client-centered practice. So um, I'm getting students to understand, you know, they need to focus on what the need is and understand, you know, the population they're going to be treating. And that way they know, you know, how to guide their practice and what their goal is. And then finally, um, I wanted to discuss the consequences, which are those areas in red around the outside. Um, and one of the, the first one I like to discuss, I feel like is a really major one for students, and that's just the growth of professional development. Service learning really allows students to strengthen a lot of their skills, 
So whether it be um, their knowledge of occupational therapy and what they're going to be doing and actually applying the practice, applying the information that they've been learning so far in school. I feel like it also increases confidence, um, giving them the idea of how they're going to treat patients because I feel like that's a big thing um, students and new practitioners struggle with. And then you also see an increase in communication skills and critical thinking skills, throwing the students out there and, you know, requiring them to start thinking like a practitioner, planning, planning for treatment, things like that. And then also cultural competencies. So there, you know, while we're in school, we, I feel like we learn about just a general patient. We don't really attach any kind of character to them, any personality, you know, what their culture is. So. This will allow the students to know what they're going to be treating um, based on different people. Um, and then another consequence is community service. So students are going to gain a better understanding of what the need is within the community and become more aware of this need and the issues. And I feel like when the student has a better understanding, they may you know, take another step to help the community. I know how easy it is to get kind of caught up in your schooling and your work, so I feel like that sometimes gets, you know, gets put on the back burner, so. And then my last consequence, uh, consequence I want to discuss is the community partners. So through the development of, or through com the service learning, um, colleges and community partners are able to build a relationship, which in return benefits both um, the college is, you know, open to new places and they're able to open up education to their students, whereas, and then in return, the college part, or the community partners, um, such as homeless shelters, things like that, also build relationships that could benefit the community as well. So, um, you know, saying occupational therapy does service learning, well, then they get nursing involved, so there's another service that can be provided to the homeless. So I just feel that service learning is a really, you know, big area that could be tackled a little bit more and included in college programs because students are learning and there's, you know, they're still capable of providing some services. So that is that. Great, Kelsey. Thoughts for Kelsey? I just have a comment. I um, I liked how you had the the importance of the cultural understanding of the populations they will be teaching um i just that just stuck with me because when i was an elementary ed major everything was you know textbook of this is how you teach and this is classroom management and i i did take a diversity class but you know it really did equip me for you know truly understanding the cultural population and i felt like that was something that i needed a little bit more of um, and so I, I just, I really just wanted to comment that I like that, that you found that that's such an important topic to understand, you know, who you're dealing with to really, truly be effective. So, yeah, I feel like you learn about one particular, you know, you just learn, you learn about diagnoses and you learn about this specific thing, but you really, you know, you get in your head of just a specific thing, but you really don't understand all the different factors that play a part of it. So I felt like that was really important. Yeah, Kelsey, I really liked it too. I we have uh, we were matched up in the triad on the discussion club with Ann, so I was able to read as your attributes and and all of those things were coming together. And it's been fun to see your visual here tonight because it's the coming together of all those factors. And so I see that you've changed some of those things. Um, I'm wondering, kind of just thinking in my head out loud about wondering for you, are you planning on continuing to research this topic? Is this kind of where you think it's going? And if so, how would you, I guess, how would you research that more based on the, some of those attributes and how you they are for your profession? Um, yeah, I actually talked to Dr. Linden, I feel like, about this the other day. Um, and I, last semester, the project we had to do um, when we developed the course was related to this as well. So I feel like this has become my major area of interest. Um, and talking to, doc talking to Dr. Linden really got me thinking about how I could really, you know, pursue this. So I am interested in looking more 
maybe through College of St. Mary and um, professors I used to work with, seeing how I can't, how I could possibly research this more. Um, I've done a lot of research as far as articles go, and I've looked at other um, colleges that have done service learning. Um, I believe Creighton does. Uh, I know like their dentistry school, I think does some, something like this, and I think a couple other programs too, possibly nursing. Um, so I am interested to see, especially with occupational therapy, it's kind of a tricky area as far as that goes. So yeah, I have thought about it. Um, Wayne State has a, a, a school that we deal with service learning. We have an entire um, sort of multiple offices where they strictly deal with uh, using service learning in the classroom, which would be interesting for you to get. Yeah, that's helpful. It's, yeah, it's always nice because before, you know, even before this class, I kind of thought about this topic. Um, I just thought it would be interesting for College of St. Mary to start something like this. Um, so it's nice to hear what schools have tried it, um, to know kind of what, how it worked and how they did it and things like that. Yeah, our Department of Social Sciences has, uh, does a lot with this. So if you want any information at any point, don't have to ask. I can get you something from them to kind of see what they do, if that gives you some ideas of something done elsewhere. Yeah, that would be awesome. I would really appreciate that. No problem. Okay. I'm really interested in your topic too, so I was paired with you as well, so I really liked watching yours come together, because I like to use service learning. I think it is so important that students give back to their communities, and I think this is one way we do it, and we learn in the process, and I think it just makes us grow and be better people. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Since you mentioned Creighton, I'll just put a plug in that Creighton will have Project Homeless Connect in a couple of weeks, which will be a interprofessional uh, day that they hold with people from the campus get connected with um, different agencies and get support as well as have options to connect with uh, health sciences people such as OT so you could volunteer <laughs> or that sort of thing um, with the profession so that's an option. What's that what was that called? It's Project Homeless Connect. Project Homeless I can send an email. I can send a link to that. That would be awesome. Thank you. Okay. Okay great thanks. So Kelsey, um, Dr. Kristen Matson is the coordinator of service learning or the director of service learning at College of St. Mary. So she would be another resource. I can send you her information as well. That would be awesome. This is great. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> networking is a wonderful thing through these classes. Christina, I have a question for you. I'm not sure if you're aware, but do you know if they still do VA stand down in the community? Are you familiar with that? No. Nursing, being, I mean, they, they do clinical that nursing, they preceptorship, but I don't know that specific title. VA Stand Down was a um, community wide um, interdis interdisciplinary service for veterans on one day. It was uh, used to be in December and then they changed it. And um, since it wasn't in um, our curriculum, days that we were available, we weren't able to continue using it. I was just curious, because that's a very powerful, very powerful um, com oh. community service. That's where we used to do a lot of our service learning with the students, too. So I was just curious if it still was in existence. December is difficult because the students are, you know, because they're wrapping up with finals cool. at that time. Right, right. And so when they moved that, that became an issue for us because we can't keep people necessarily past the semester right. so yeah okay mm -hmm. so this is seems to be a very hot topic Kelsey so very good thank you I did have one question um you know I've looked at your diagram a couple of different times and I know you said you moved some things around which is fine um the client-centered practice where they actually do the uh, interaction with clients do you see that as an attribute in or is that not how you interpreted that? I was thinking of it more as uh, preparing for client center practice. Oh, I see. I feel like that's a struggle um, for students, so maybe I need to reword that a little bit. But, so that was um, more that they're yeah, prepared. Yeah, because I feel like sometimes it's more focused, especially as a student or a new practitioner, you're focused on different 
parts of it and you kind of forget that, you know, that piece of it. So okay. I think that's where I was going with that. Okay, that makes sense. And then, so the attributes under service learning then are what at this point? Um, experiential learning and then the awareness of community. Got it. Learning. Got it. That's okay. Yep, I just used curriculum. I don't know if I've aired that somewhere, but curriculum is under my antecedent. Sure, that makes sense to me. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on what your attributes were. Very good. Thank you. Um, and Christina, you're up next. Okay, so I'm looking for the one I can oh there it is. You found it? Yep. Let me see. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, we'll let you go whenever you're ready. Okay, everybody's good at seeing the PowerPoint? Yep, okay. So. Okay, so my um, concept that I've been looking at over the last couple of weeks um, is curriculum design, and I selected this uh, concept. Um, because I wanted a broad uh, concept that I could um, look at that would span um, possibly PK through 12 that would be applicable to higher education and potentially have relevance to training or um, continuing education programming, um, as well as um, uh, I, the purpose I had for um, looking at this um, as well was um, my, my other educational concepts and interests include instruction design, um, computer-based instruction, teaching learning practices, um, and those sorts of things. And when I looked at those different, um, uh, those different uh, concepts, the thread that I could see through all of them um, was curriculum. And so I thought to start me off with a very early course that it would uh, it would give me a good foundation if I looked at curriculum design and see what I could learn and use my time wisely. So, when I looked at the literature, um, I found two pieces that really helped me pull my definition together. Um, the first one was um, this this piece from Medical Education with Barrage and Harris. And what it gave me to help me with my definition was it for uh, curriculum was that curriculum is both an entity and a process. So, and it also gave me some elements of curriculum that helped me develop my definition. As well as this, um, these pieces from this, uh, from Reams, which is from graduate education literature, um, that also provided some key elements that connected back to the medical education, um, as well as I was able to pull out um, some curricular framework information um, that helped me while I was developing my diagram. So my definition of curricul um, curriculum design is curriculum is both a process of methodical design and a body of work that guides a program of study. Curriculum includes planning, framework, and continuous improvement of educational programs that meet the needs of students, institutions, community, and workforce. So, this is probably going to be very small on the screen, but I did notice if you want to put the little button at the top, you can make it bigger. So take a look. Here's my diagram. So, I'd like to first look at it and talk about the antecedents. 
and the antecedent um, that I get, um, the antecedent that I uh, identified um, that needs to be present before um, curriculum design is uh, I call it disruptive change, um, and I'm willing to consider um, a different term. Because I talked to Dr. Linden, and she said, um, "What about uh, I think impetus for change?" Um, I'm willing to consider that too. Uh, but some things that um, some elements of disruptive change um, would be a workforce-driven, uh, research or standards um, driven. So these changes might happen in order to push us to develop curriculum or to uh, revise the curriculum. And then if we go up to the attributes that help us uh, define the characteristics of curriculum design, um, you'll see that I have it listed as a process. This is based on um, my definition. So the first part of the process is curriculum planning, which I have listed as a, is process driven. Um, part of this uh, curriculum planning process is collecting and researching information um, from stakeholders. So stakeholders would be faculty or students, community, workforce members, um, reviewing um, the institution where the curriculum is, reviewing their um, institutional mission goals and aligning those with specific uh, specific competencies, um, standards, accreditation standards, or depending on the curriculum, other guiding principles. Next, we move to the next phase, which is uh, listed their curricular framework. Uh, at this point, we bring forward the information from the curricular planning stage. We blend it with um, subject matter expertise and teaching learning expertise in order to create that body of work that guides the program. Then we move on to uh, the continuous improvement phase. Um, that continuous improvement um, phase is both a process and an entity or a body of work. Initially, this part, um, in this uh, part of the phase, we define uh, an evaluation plan and identify student artifacts um, that help um, identify or identify within that evaluation plan. Um, in a curriculum, it must. Uh, be continually evaluated. I'm sure we hear that all the time. <laughs> so in order to do that, we need to have that evaluation plan established. Um, and then continually, um, we identify if we've met the threshold or the benchmarks that we've determined um, if student learning has occurred. If not, then something would happen where we'd identify uh, a, continuous more, um, a continuous improvement plan in order to um, improve that curriculum and improve the teaching and learning, what have you, and then reevaluate. So that's why it's a continuous process there. Um, now I'd like to move on to the consequences or outcomes. Uh, the consequences or consequences or outcomes of having curriculum design would be that we have mm -hmm. evidence based informed practices to meet standards, as well as competent practitioners or a competent uh, graduate. I've identified some related concepts that um, could be used to help uh, have another lens to look at um, the idea of curriculum design uh, further, as well as sub-concepts that were, could allow, uh, at another time, further exploration um, to dig deeper into those topics related to curriculum design. Here are my references. Thank you all. Do you have any questions for me? Christina, um, I saw that Susan yeah. po posted that you um, have such a nice visual. Um, do you work with visual diagrams like that very much, or? I, I tend to do those a lot in the work I do. Uh -huh. uh, I do some processing and stuff at work, and actually, while I was working on this, I, I don't know if you guys, I worked with somebody, I think I worked with Robin for some of my posts, 
I truthfully swirled around trying to figure out really what I was trying to say, and it it didn't really come to me while I was writing my paper. I kind of was doing my visual and writing my paper at the same time. So, because I, I was swirling myself in it, and it didn't come together until I was doing the bulk at the same time. Uh, uh huh. Um, Christina, regarding your visual, I liked it as well. You spoke quite a bit uh, about the the process, and I liked how you had that circle to show that it was a process and it continued around. Mm -hmm. But do you think it might help with the reader's understanding of the concept and the process if you added a little bit more of some of what you said? Like if that was just maybe its own visual even and and you had just a few more of those elements that you were talking about when mm -hmm. you were describing the different parts of the process do you think that might help your your uh someone understand the concept maybe a little bit more or the process a little bit more because i love what you were saying but i don't know that i necessarily would get that from that visual you know what i'm saying yeah you get that from the paper, from <laughs> there, the paper. Just were so, there were so many and i think our direction said we had to classify them or categorize them so I chose to do that I get what you're saying like I could probably um, add those my diagram was getting so large that I cut yeah. things out I could see where just that gray the gray circle was its own diagram mm -hmm. and then, and right. then that was it was called like the, the process of curriculum design and then you just yeah. went into a little bit more detail with a few more rectangles that would kind of explain that process. Because I thought that was really interesting how you explained it. I like that. In very detail. Yeah, thank you. That helped. <laughs> yep. And Christina, I just, your topic, you have a great topic. And it's, it's so awesome because it's applicable to every everybody, you know. It's mm -hmm. such a core component of everything that we do. So I'm, and that's great. And I kind of think about that when I was thinking about mine too. There's just so much. I'm trying to get my hands I'm very visual. Like, but then how are you gonna narrow it down to make it more? I don't know what you want it to be. Or have you thought about how you can isolate some key components of it to make it, um, I guess, more manageable? You mean for further? Yeah, and I guess even for this too, because as a concept, it's just massive, you know, it's still big. So, I'm just trying to figure out how I would wrap my head around that would be, I just, I don't know, I have to think about that a little bit. So, good, congratulations for what you've done on it, it's, been, it's great, I, I'd have a hard time doing that. Yeah, I scrolled for quite a while, I did. <laughs> I think when you, if you give it, to put it in a certain context, right? I think the concept analysis, you're looking at the concept, but then you take it and you take it into the direction that you are interested in taking it. And I, you could speak to that, Dr. Linden, but that's what I, that's the way I did it, is I took my big picture and then I, what am I interested in? And then that's the direction I took it. And that's when I really got excited about the concept when I could find someone I was interested in. So maybe that's what will happen to you. Yeah. The nice thing I liked is I was able to find commonalities across so many different di disciplines. So I pulled mm -hmm. out the commonalities in order to say, this is what I can find at this point about curriculum. So I didn't really... At first I swirled because I was getting too much into the nitty gritty of different models or something. But once I tried to stay more at the surface, it started mm -hmm. coming together. I liked your first visual with the kind of that modified Venn diagram or that Venn diagram where you you had all things that you were interested in and then you saw the common thread <laughs> was curriculum design. That was really a good way to go about that. So, thank you. You know, some of those points are really good because there's sort of that inductive and then there's the deductive way of going about some of these things. And <clears throat> it's, it's, um, the topics are big. And so sometimes you have to do it at a more global level. And then sometimes you want to focus on just some 
key point in the the bigger picture and so there's no right or wrong with it i think that throughout all of these presentations the the benefit is that you really look at some of these literature definitions and you're able to pick out the best pieces and make them your own and i think that makes that cognitive um, process so strong for each of you. I think you can, just by your presentations, you articulate them so clearly now. Has that been a difference? Could you have articulated these, this same concept prior to the concept analysis process? And in fact, I found one of the um, articles I saw, I found was emotion regulate, re regulation, a concept in need of a definition, which oops, could be an article written about all of our concepts that had that same title. So, right. Well, there you go. There's your publication, Patty. <laughs> concept analysis. <laughs> Huh? The definition of, and then you just fill in the blank. You could each do that, right? Right. <laughs> that is a huge contribution to the profession if you have a clear definition from all these experts and then you synthesize them together. That's, I mean, that's really a gift to the profession that, or the topic that you're talking about. Well, um, I, I think it's interesting, but every single one of you um, was done with your presentation in seven minutes. So I think that's very funny because that was a lot of material. <laughs> yes, very clapping. <laughs> Lots of material to cover, and um, you all did it extremely well, thorough. In fact, I have not had um, six people ever have every one of them done so well, I don't think. And um, the the content was good, but the presentations were also very good. So I'm thrilled for all uh, six of you. Um, I am going to ask a couple of um, sort of reflection questions now for all of you regarding the um, actual um, concept analysis process. So um, and this is more discussion, so you maybe could um, just bring up your, yeah, I see that um, that Patty has a smiling face, so um, maybe you could each put up your uh, emoji here. Um, where are those? Are those right there? Yep. Where the smiley face is below your names, there's emojis. And so um, maybe we'll so do, uh, huh? Let's update my stack oh. on that's what I clicked on. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that's what it says. Um, so regarding the um, experience that you had with concept analysis, um, talk about your response during the first week of trying to understand concept analysis. Would you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down or confused or happy or... Susan was a little confused. Lots of confusion and... Uh... And so, what made it the what made it so confusing? Would you say? I just thought it was just a lot of content. You know, it was just trying to wrap your head around the content, coming up with the idea based on the interest area. So, I just started reading articles about stuff I was interested in, and started seeing common themes. But it took a long time to get there. But once I got there, then it was. Felt like I had a direction. Uh huh. So actually, choice of choice of the 
the concept you mean, Susan? Yes, the choice of the concept was kind of getting a handle on what that was, and then after that, then I felt like it was much Okay, good. Uh, I think I got it because I'm the... Go ahead. You go first. I'm, I, I was going to say, I think I understood it because I tend to be the annoying one that, that emails and asks too many questions. <laughs> so I, I'm sure I annoyed Dr. Linton to the point that it was clear for me what I needed to do um, once I asked a lot of questions. Because I, I started out a little confused, but, you know, when I spoke up and asked right away, I thought you really did an excellent job of clarifying things for me. Uh, so I knew where I was going. Because I had an idea right away. It was just finding direction for me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, same with me, too. And I think once I read that uh, Walker and Avant article and saw your PowerPoint about it, then that's when I it became clear to me. So I don't know. Maybe that's something that you start off with right there. Move, move up. I, I, right yeah, I think that's probably what I will do. Linear. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm really linear when I look at when I look at the syllabus, especially with the online, and I follow exactly. In order, do, 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 do. And I found that uh, I was having to do the concept analysis to articles before I really understood what concept analysis was. And once I understood what concept analysis was, I was fine. But mm -hmm. I think that's what con was confusing for me is uh, because I think we had to. Um, do uh, matrix. We had to have some articles analyzed for the matrix mm -hmm. right out of the gate, and I wasn't really sure what concept analysis was. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And I, I, I started with it. crossover and antecedents and attributes and stuff. So until I got a grasp, and and the the chapter helped me a lot too. That same chapter. Once I got through that, it really did become yeah. clear what you were looking for. Because I struggled with. Okay, what's the difference between attribute and antecedent? I mean, I knew what it said it was, but everything seemed to cross over for me, and it was really hard to make. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Robin, what were you going to? Were you going to say something? Yeah, I um, I in the beginning I was looking at curriculum design, and I just have to give Christina a high five because I was so overwhelmed. <laughs> I don't even. I have no idea how to do any of this, and um. I think it goes with Patty. After I read that article, I was like, okay, I need to be more specific. I need to, mm -hmm. you know, and I just thought I need to start small because I know I cannot tackle something like curriculum design. So when I saw Christina, I thought, whoa, if anybody's going to handle it, she, you know, <laughs> I give her a high five because I thought, you know, yes. your visual was, you know, to the point. And I just, I felt like I had all of this information and I was able to siphon it down. And once I was able to siphon it down and get a little bit more specific, then the attributes and the antecedents and the consequences kind of made more sense to me. And I was like, I get it now. Okay. But up in the beginning, no. <laughs> right. Right. So um, at this point then, um, what is your reaction to the, the process of doing a concept analysis? How would you, what emoji would you give it at this point, interesting. So, quite a change, which is I ideal for a class, I guess, to have, feel good about the, the process at the end of the end of it. But talk a little about that now, how how you feel and what what your reaction to the concept analysis process is. Um I I will say that I I also had trouble with at least especially the antecedents and the defining attributes. Um, kind of a struggle for me in the beginning, and I feel like I still need to work on that. But overall, the whole process is really helpful when it comes to tools. Um, because I know I talked to you, Dr. London, when we were on the phone. Um, that often I, you know, overlook information or miss things. So I feel like this really made me really analyze the articles. So I feel like it really helped me work on it. Good. It made me feel more prepared 
to uh, work on a dissertation. Oh, good. Because it gave me a focus. And I feel like I'll be better at looking at um, articles. And when I'm doing my research, I feel like I'll be better at looking for uh, relevant articles, too. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things about a dissertation is that it typically has numerous concepts in it. You know, it depends on what you're really going to be studying, but there's always the population that you're going to be studying so that you need to have some content or some of those kinds of pieces as well. And then sometimes the related topics or a subtopic also is important for it. So this um, might be a central piece for you or it might not be something you wanna continue working with, but you will find that you will have sections of major um, topics in your dissertation and you might have four or five of them and so you sort of need to have clear direction on all of those. I thought too that this process was good for me because I had to really refine my subject articles and books. Uh-huh. So I made I made trips to the library with my librarian. Um, I really designed my students. I thought this was really helpful preparing for the end game, like what Patty said. Uh -huh. I'm a little bit more prepared and confident in, in my self efficacy and researching those things it increased. Well, very interesting. Um, so let's, I, uh, I think I just muted somebody. Um, sorry about that. Um, so let's talk now about your educational concepts themselves. What do you feel as far as the understanding of your concept? Do you feel like you have grown in your actual understanding of what the topic is that you have chosen? basic knowledge of my concept before. Uh -huh. It was something I was interested in before, so I knew about it, but I feel like I know way more about it. And and I had to look at, at it outside of teaching, which was good. So some of the resources that I, I used had to do with like psychotherapy and things like that. So to have, have to look at it outside of the realm of teaching was good, was interesting. I hmm. got a lot from that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would have done it if I would have done it. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, I, I was just agreeing with Patty in that I had to kind of take myself out of the equation to be biased from the teaching perspective mm -hmm. and kind of look at it with a new set of eyes. And um, that was, you know, that approach was different for me. And I, I, I felt like I was able to understand the concept better taking, removing my past thoughts and feelings and so, you know, I, I definitely agree with you, Patty. It, it made it a little bit, it clarified things a lot for me. Hmm. Um, I agree with that, but mine was kind of the opposite. I've always looked at service learning from an, as far as occupational therapy goes as a, as a treatment, and it really helped to tie in those educational concepts because I, you know, that's a piece that I feel like I was really missing. So it was really nice to kind of jump into the education piece of it and see how it kind of ties in to, you know, the curriculum or the program. I really liked that. I really liked the Walker and Avant um, article and how that really gave us that that feeling for once we, we read that. And it just told us that we needed to, that it might be a frustrating process. <laughs> going over it and refining it but it's okay <laughs> and just take it I mean basically it told me that everything we went through to do this was part of the process and not to get frustrated or think that you don't know what you're doing but to be open to it 
And so that's what I, once I knew that's what we were supposed to be doing, I liked that it, I went ahead and just went with it. Whatever I found, if I found it in social work, if I found it in nursing or whatever, wherever I found the article that seemed relevant, I was open to that. I didn't try to make myself stay specific to education or anything. That way I cast a pretty good net. So that was most helpful to me. I don't know if everybody did it, but Dr. Lynn, I, I really found that um, it was in the Getting Started module, and it was the View Finding a Research Topic presentation that you did. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you had a sample where you had your topic, and then you had the who, what, where, when, um, all that. Mm -hmm. And I did that, and it was so interesting to, to again, think outside the context that I'd been thinking. And think about synonyms for teacher. Oh, uh huh. Consider gender and age and uh, ethnicity. Of I hadn't really thought about that before. Or think of the synonyms for emotion regulation, and that helped with the research too. To think to to hear it called emotional intelligence and mindfulness and self labor and all that. So that was just a really interesting exercise that I highly recommend that. You do if you have a chance to do it, that you do it because it really does help you think of all the different ways that it can be found and used. So you will One be. Another article that was really helpful, I thought, was the um, leading change to concept analysis article, where they basically did the whole concept analysis. So that was really helpful for me. The, um, Nelson Brantley Ford article. I thought that that was really helpful how they laid it out. Um, give me an idea, kind of a gauge to, to do it. Good. Um, I agree. So I was going to respond to. Um, well, first of all, I think that, that both um, Christina's comments and Patty's comments are very applicable not only to this process, but certainly when you start writing your research proposal, you will probably go through the same thing about, okay, this is the what you're interested in researching, and then all of these things again, um, you know, to hone down what you really are wanting to research, because there is so much on every topic and that's where that came from was, um, you know, when you get ready to actually do a research study. And then also uh, what Christina said about keeping an open mind and looking at other disciplines. And I think a number of you have said that, too, is that um, you can enhance your work by being very broad in what you are willing to um, sort of gather and then sift through it and then you have to delete those things that aren't pertinent. But that analysis piece is um, critical for the work you'll be doing in the future. So I'm glad you feel that that has been somewhat helpful. Um, and it continues also, as Christina mentioned, to be part of the process that you sort of it, go in cycles or Maybe it's more like a roller coaster of up and ups and downs along the way. Um, I am teaching research proposal one um, right now, and that's where they write chapters one and two of their research proposal, and they will say the same thing. It's like, oh my gosh, I've rewritten this chapter six times, and I just had an email from someone, and they said. Um, so I had it ready to post, but now I found something else. So I want to add that in before I send it. But would you rather get it now or would you rather get it after I've worked on it this evening? And, you know, like, you no, know, work on it and then send it to me when you feel like you're ready to send it so that it's all a process and it can be very um, challenging, if not frustrating at times. So um maybe experiencing that now and knowing that that's normal will uh, help you down the road. Um, so why don't you do one more um, emoticon and um, give a thumbs up or a thumbs down next to your name for the <clears throat> thought about using this as a potential dissertation topic. And um, I guess you could put a confused face if you don't know yet because that's um, certainly an acceptable response to anything's fine, whatever you're feeling.
Interesting. So no one's tossing it out, huh? It's okay if there's something that you're like, oh, this is not going to be it because um, that's as important as a decision as finding the right one. So, If anything, it, it enhanced my desire to pursue it further. So, Well, good. I mean, I just feel like I'm on the right track. Yeah. I am urging working, but I'm, I'm a yeah. Oh. <laughs> It's not working, huh? <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's uh, if you continue in that vein, and it's okay if you don't, but um, when you get to doing um, dissertation readings, which is um, right before you do your research proposal classes, that's really where you work on your literature review, and that's really the crux of the time that you have to commit to a topic then Otherwise, you almost have to rework the dissertation process. So um, that's when it's like really important that you have a, a sense of what direction you want to go um, for a topic, because that's when you really gather the most of the literature that you will need for um, for your dissertation. So that's a a good year off for you, but that's still a, uh, if you're gathering things now and you're passionate about it, that gives you a leg up on getting that underway. So very good. <clears throat> um, so any final questions or thoughts for me? It's nine o'clock and um, you did really well in getting your seven minutes covered for all of your presentations, but any other things that you want to comment on or um, ask questions about? Well, your papers are due um, next Sunday, I believe, and um, you all seem to be in a pretty good place with those, so that's very impressive. I think you've worked really, really hard this semester, I can tell that. Uh, it's been a pleasure to read your work and to um, dialogue with you as well, and certainly meet some of you face-to-face um, -face and others online like this. Uh, I am teaching qualitative research um, this rest of the semester, so I will be working with the majority of you again, I think. Um, and some of you may want to do um, continue to work on your topics for that. So um, I think that starts the 18th of March. Um, so you'll have a little time to complete the um, adult learning theory. And then um, we'll jump into qualitative research together. Any final thoughts, questions? Okay, well, have a good, good job, yep, have a good rest of the semester, um, or the rest of the first half, and we will see most of you, I think, in, on March 18th. Thank Bye. You. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank <laughs> you.